The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We, could also, we would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. And that will take us to um, the pledge. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's Color Guard is Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Heaven Green. The state flag is carried by Cadet Colonel Gabriella Larson. The right guard is Cadet Staff Sergeant Sophia Burkhalter. The left guard is Cadet Captain Clayton Hove. And the alternates tonight are Cadet Airman Ryan Manning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So proud of them. All right, we will now move to our special recognition and presentation portion of the meeting. Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our family partners in education recognition tonight? Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, and Superintendent Stuck. So nice to see all of you guys once again. The Family Partners in Education program is an opportunity for the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. For tonight's Family Partners in Education, we have Springview Middle School Principal Daniel Lauer joining us to introduce the Sabins family. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Stock. The Springview students and staff are incredibly grateful for the support of the Sabins family. Their youngest son, Kyle, is in seventh grade. Both Melissa and Sean have contributed their time and care to Springview over the years. This year, in, in particular, Melissa stepped up to fill in our PTC president role. Since taking over this important role at our site, Melissa has organized spirit wear sales and staff appreciation lunches. Luncheons. Staff has been a key, or Sean has been a key member of our Springview Wrestling coaching staff for the past four years. He spends countless hours supporting wrestlers on the mat and assisting with other coaching duties. This past October, Sean volunteered to be a chaperone for our four-day marine biology field trip. On this trip, he was in charge of a cabin filled with seventh grade boys, participated in hikes, and other science activities. Also, Sean volunteered his time at our Day of Awesomeness in October. This four-hour long event was outside, and we had over 200 students participating in trike races, inflatable slides, and other games. We truly appreciate all the Sabins do for our Springview community. So again, this is great. Thank you very much. This is the Sabins family, and I love the Arizona hat. Um, this is one of those things, again, this is a great example of a family who truly gives as a family. So not only helping out with the wrestling, helping out with PTC, doing all those things and that commitment. So just thank you very much. Again, this is one of those things that makes, this is one of the families, and it's a great example of why Rockland's a great place to raise the kids and have a family. And thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you guys have done. Cool River Pizza donated a uh, pizza for the family tonight.
awesome. Thank you so much. And Chief Dosange, will you introduce our employee recognition tonight? President Hub trustees and Superintendent Stock, tonight for our employee recognition, we have Valley View Elementary School Principal Sherry Anderson joining us to introduce Lori Kruss, who works hard to provide students with the highest level of rigor and support for them to be successful. Good evening, trustees, superintendent, stock. Valley View Elementary would like to recognize Lori Cruz as being an extremely valuable team member. Lori has been in Rockland Unified and at Valley View since 2018 when she began in our K3 SDC class, which is now our 1-3 SDC class. Lori is compassionate, committed, and supported, supportive to other team members. Her compassion spreads to all students, but most especially those who, face, those who face more difficulties than others. She understands a variety of disabilities and has an authentic way of validating, normalizing, and mitigating struggles for students. I have observed students new to Lori's class have a great sense of calm and belonging once they settle in. Lori is committed to providing all students with the highest level of rigor and support needed to be successful. This is evident by her overall academic, social, emotional, and behavioral improvements that her students make under her strong guidance. She is committed to our school team, as well as serving on our PBIS Tier 2, 3 team, offering her knowledge and experience in planning interventions and supports for our teachers and general population. She regularly collaborates with general education teachers, making sure that both classes are accessible and a priority for her students. Lori is supportive in any way possible around our campus. When there's a new team member, Lori offers to assist in onboarding, training, and supporting them to their comfort level. She will meet after school, have them join her class to see how a task or activity is done, and has modeled in other classrooms to support teaching and learning. She has recently recruited other SDC teachers throughout the district to meet in her classroom monthly for support and collaboration regarding best practices. Lori is humorous and humble. She will act as if she's not worthy of this and then make a joke of it. We know she truly is worthy. Lori's energy is endless and she has a drive to excel. How do I know this? Well, first of all, she recently added a new male to her household, much to her husband's dismay. <laughs> the good news is Doug is a young canine that requires a lot of Lori's attention. Brian really does like Doug as well. <laughs> After school, she can be found taking her girls, Ava and Audrey, to the many activities that, they, that keep them busy. But if that isn't enough to demonstrate Lori's energy, Lori also recently qualified for the Boston Marathon in which she will be competing August 17th. Lori is a blessing to us all. Let's cheer. Lori on as she continues to do great things for Rockland Unified. Thank you. That was amazing. I even need this or if it's even on. Lori, we are so grateful to have you on behalf of the board. Thank you for all that you do. When you listen to those words that she used to describe you, compassionate, supportive, humble, you must have a huge heart, and we so appreciate all that you do for kids, and it sounds like you're also a great staff member and colleague, so thank you again. We have this fun basket, and this for you.
That was so fun to watch your family while, while uh, Principal Anderson was reading the, um, the words about you. They, she obviously was nailing it pretty good because your kids were nodding and looking at you like, that's right, that's right. <laughs> All right, families, thank you so much for coming. We sure appreciate having you here to support your um, family members and friends, but you don't have to stay if you don't want to. We'd love to have you, but you can leave now. This is a good time. I won't laugh into the microphone, but... <laughs> All right, so we will now move on to the employee organization reports. Welcome CSEA President Chuck Haddix to present the CSEA report. We, we were just commenting that, and now there's two. <laughs> Good evening, President Hupp, trustees and superintendent Stock. So I see it on the docket tonight. The district has made a new position as a lead computer support tech for TK through A to help support the, uh, the computer support uh, techs TK through A. Um, and they're making it into a, a lead computer support tech position. This is going to go to the 610 process with the CSEA and I'm waiting on it to be reviewed by the CSEA. Then after the 6th process, we will ratify it with the members. Also, the reduction of hours was submitted to the CSEA for the 6th process, and I'm waiting to ratify the reduction of hours with the members as well. Um, all of this was negotiated and sent into the CSEA for 6th process before today's March 15th deadline. Mm -hmm. So that was awesome. Um, we also have contacted our labor rep to start the process of sunshining our articles to the district for negotiations, but I'm still waiting for that to be returned to me from the CSEA as well. Um, once everything is, um, once I get everything back, uh, we have our normal meeting um, at the end of the month on Monday, March 27th at our regular chapter meeting. Um, we'll ratify everything then, and then I'll bring it back to the board on April 19th. That's all I have. Awesome. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we would like to welcome our TPA president, Travis Mojet, to present the RTPA report. You know, as, as I look at, well, good evening, first of all. Um, as I look at Chuck and I over there, I feel really bad not making the last meeting, and Chuck probably was there all by himself. So, <laughs> Chuck, I apologize. Hopefully it won't happen again. Um, uh, I come to you guys with, uh, I want to start out with, with some major thanks and gratitude. Um, so I couldn't make the meeting last, last or two weeks ago now, as you guys know, um, but I was able to send, uh, send my notes ahead of time. And not only did I like actually, I, I got the responses, I got the feedback, but I actually got to see it tangibly happening. Um, I was laying in bed like dying, but I was well enough to, to rewind when I wasn't coughing my lungs out. So... Um, and it was awesome to see the dialogue happening, which wasn't an easy or fun dialogue in some essences, um, around uh, saving and protecting programs in the district. And I can't tell you enough how much that means to, obviously, those individual programs, but most importantly, the kids. I mean, the, the fact that those kids came up here and spoke on behalf of their programs, like, I'm just sitting in bed going like, oh, there's no way this doesn't go through. Like, who can say no to the, the heartstrings they're pulling on? Not to mention just the reality of what those kids were, were advocating for in their programs at, at Rockland High. Um, so I want to just uh, extend a huge thank you um, and, and motion of gratitude to you guys. Um, because I know that decision, it comes with compromises and, and things on the back end, and it's going to impact everybody. And, you know, and, and Barbara, you're fun uh, of, of juggling the, the, fight, the fiscal pieces of that and, and Tony and Marty and Bill and the Ed Services and Human Resources side. And 
but it's, it's the thing that, that if we're going to have compromises and concessions, programs and for students is the, the area we've got we've to be willing to do that. Um, and, and Tiffany, I want to acknowledge your comments uh, in your email today that it didn't land everywhere in all the programs, but there's still conversations continuing about the computer science at middle school, for example, um, and just making sure that, that you know, we keep beating that horse, for lack of a better term. Um, one area I do want to emphasize on that as we are looking at programs and things, and, and we are in a reality of where we're having to talk cutbacks and things like that, whether it's March or just the spring nature of, of school districts, is um, that while we continue to look at programs and, and make concessions and, and, and be creative um, in our adjustments, that we try to keep the, the balance between those. I know one thing that's come to me a lot from the middle school side of things um, that I want to share with you guys is the, what, what the perception of growing unbalanced between one of our middle schools and another with what offerings they're able to provide. And now some of that obviously comes with limitations of credentials and staffing, but some of it is just by nature of, of choice and priority sometimes too. So just making sure that we're doing our best to look at how we can keep that balance so we're not overwhelming schools or underwhelming schools or, or giving students and families the reasons to, to need to go to other schools versus ones they might naturally be zoned for or have preference to be at. So I know we do a great job um, keeping our high schools balanced and, and for whatever reason our middle schools have started to grow to a little bit of unbalance between the two in their elective offerings specifically. So just something to just keep looking at and, and I know we're, uh, we're hearing out our, our staff on that side, and I know you guys are open to hearing that out as well, and just, again, looking at what creative things we can come up with, with the limited resources and options that we have, obviously. So, again, huge thank you to you guys. Um, I, I love that you guys made that decision, because I know it made Tony's world flip a little bit, and, but it's a good problem for us to work through together, and I think it's a good problem where we can collaborate and, and come up with where, you know, where's that, the resources for that program going to come from, because it just doesn't appear out of thin air. So again, thank you guys for that, and, and thank you for exercising your authority to, to make choices that you feel are best for kids and, um, and things. And it was just cool to see the reality of, like, here's a recommendation, and then the board would be like, yeah, but here's what we're thinking, and then have that, that good back-and-forth dialogue like we've talked about for years, like we're not always going to agree, but like if we're agreeing that what's best for kids is the priority, I think you guys demonstrated that better than ever in that, in that meeting around the, the photo conversation specifically. So again, thank you guys for that. Um, continuing down that, that path of March and kind of the unfun parts of March I mentioned when I was up here uh, late February is um, I do want to commend Tony and his department and Matt Murphy especially um, with Tony, the the pink slipping and layoffing and, and juggling of people couldn't have landed any smoother than it did. Because um, in the reality of things is, while we release temps every year, we often on years we, we have to release or talk about reductions for permanent staff members, but every permanent staff member this year had somewhere to land, right? They might be shuffling and moving and maybe even changing sites, uh, grade levels, all that stuff, but everybody had at least somewhere to land, and some even have some options with their landing spots on kind of because of their credentialing and things. So it, those meetings, as, as much fun as they aren't, couldn't have been any better because every one of them had the silver lining of we're talking about where are you going to be next year, and it's still with Rockland Unified. It's not good luck. How can we help you land somewhere, but it's unfortunately not going to be us. So again, want to commend Tony and Matt for doing their work in their departments and all their support staff for that because they're not fun conversations, but at least if the alternative is you're still a Rockland employee, we have that to, to hold on to all these wonderful people that, that are serving our kids and our programs across the district. So, Tony, thank you on behalf of RTPA. And Matt, as I know, he's got a day off and he doesn't get to come to these anyway, but hopefully he's watching in the YouTube land out there. A um, couple other things that have come my way that I don't have the solution. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm sure you guys hear these topics um, Derek, I imagine you probably have any of the board members here at the most because you get that label of like being like the, the secondary guy a lot of the time, but um, the late start conversation is starting to stir up at the high schools again. Um, I've had both uh, staff from both of the two different high schools reach out to me independently of each other actually with like some scary numbers. Rockland High reached out to me and told me that two of their programs, their, their softball and baseball programs, those kids are going to miss 24 last block classes between now and their season starts and when their season ends, assuming they don't go to postseason. That's just their regular season, and that's because of the late start thing. Now, I know the late start thing wasn't any of us in this room's decision. I don't know that any of us are even like supportive of it on the legislative slide, but I know that there's areas where uh, you as a board, we as a unit, and as a district, we can work to 
try to adjust the start and stop times to, to ease that burden a little bit, right? We are one of the districts that goes latest. And I know there's all the reasons why we have to do that with transportation. I've been in those conversations. And I, I really want to thank uh, Mr. Flowers for allowing that committee the work and time to do that. But as we explore what resources we have and look at how did this land this year, I think we need to be open to where can we dip into other resources and how can we minimize that impact moving into next year. Obviously, we're stuck with that decision for this year, but that's a crazy reality. Um, the other numbers that keep coming my way are we have, on average, it's just under three quarters of our high school students that participate in athletics. So depending on what season, spring gets hit a little heavier, but this isn't like one season, a small group of kids. This is a lot of kids all year long that are missing those last block classes and how we creatively find ways that, that they, you know, they get that instruction. We don't have to miss as much class, whatever it is. I think we, we all owe it to our students to keep exploring that. Um, uh, again, credit to Mr. Flowers. He's agreed to, to um, reconvene that late start committee and start talking about what can we do, where can we modify and move things. Obviously, the, the start and end times are kind of the big barriers we got to work through. But um, again, any, any creative ideas or solutions you guys have or areas where you guys can help with, with resources would be much appreciated in that conversation. Just how can we keep kids in our classes as long as possible so they're not having to like feel like, can I play this sport this year? I can't afford to miss it. It never fails. It's that, that difficult class, right? Whether it's math is your hard class or science or language arts or whatever. Um, so just kind of looking at how that, how that goes. So um, again, Derek, I imagine you've probably heard a lot about that as well. Um, as well as any of you guys, I just know we like to pick on Derek when it comes to those things. Um, but again, just looking at, at uh, creative ideas you guys have and, and things that maybe you can think of or areas where you can help strengthen some resources to solve some of those problems as we get there. Um, and then lastly, just, just a note of, of area of concern that, uh, that just like literally blew in yesterday, pun intended. Um, as you all know, we've been very focused the last few years on a various range of safety topics in our district, primarily COVID, right, and then active violence. Those have been like the two, two big headlines and things we've been dealing with in the last handful of years especially. Um, all that safety focus has been great, but an area where I don't know if it's just something that, that I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus that I missed as part of somebody that sits on the safety committee with Marty and looks over all the site safety plans at our campuses, but just like campus physical safety has come up recently, the storms yesterday, we had two major incidents on campus that luckily nobody was hurt, and, and only actually one campus even had any property damage to my knowledge, but we had like major trees blow over and one of them right at the end of the day when kids are dismissing and I don't know, a miracle, whatever, like it just fell like in the perfect spot and not on anybody. Uh, but just how do, we, how do we start addressing those just kind of regular or sometimes taken for granted safety needs on our campuses? Is, is there a maintenance element where we can look at, at our CSEA colleagues and, and Craig and his team and what can we do to maintain campuses a little bit better? I know their resources are stretched beyond thin anyway, but just those kinds of things as, as the extremes of, of COVID are, are behind us and the probably never extreme of, of weather is going to be behind us, but what can we do for our campuses to just maintain that safe environment? Whether it's keeping kids in during those extreme weather situations and putting in, but providing them safe environments to have those indoor recesses or lunches or whatever it is. You know, high school, we don't have indoor recess, but we have 2,000 kids that need to eat lunch out of the weather, and we don't have a facility that can reasonably do that. And when we do, supervision becomes the new challenge, right? Middle schools, I think, face it similarly. Elementary school is a little bit different animal because the classroom environment can work. But nonetheless, just how can we all continue looking at that and our, and our big safety lens of things that we just haven't had to deal with in the past, but I think... The winter weather, like we're used to fire season and we've got that one under control or at least a way to juggle, but now the winter is attacking us from all angles, it seems like. And just that, so again, those are just some concerns that have kind of recently obviously been, been prevalent. I think we're really lucky that nothing major happened to anybody, but just something to, to continue working on as we keep talking about that collaborative element of things. What does this look like where we can make things as safe as possible, but also keep our campuses as open and inviting as they possibly can be too. I don't, I don't think we have any interest in clear-cutting campuses so trees don't fall on people, but you know, what can we do that's the happy medium? So anyway, that's all I got. It's good to be back here with you guys tonight, and uh, I'm glad Chuck and I have each other to, to hang out with, so <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you, Travis, so much.
Um, so we are going to skip 7.1. Our um, student board representative is not able to join us tonight. So we'll go to item 7.2, comments from board and superintendent. Trustees, do you have board comments you would like to share tonight? I just, oh. I just have a couple. Um, Chuck and Travis, always great to hear your reports and good to hear the updates. Great to hear two positive updates tonight. So thank you for the updates to both of you. Um, I did also want to highlight just a couple things. One, um, I received an email from uh, Jeffrey Clarion, physics teacher at Rockland High, and I just wanted to take a moment to just celebrate a lot of times we uh, talk here about uh, many of the great things going on in our district, and we had an incredible group of Rockland High students uh, that just won, yes, HP Code Wars team. And so I just thought, you know, what a phenomenal uh, thing that our district provi provides such a variety of opportunities for students to connect inside school and outside of school. Um, and they sent some photos. I know I don't have them to share publicly right now, but I was just looking at those and wanted to take a minute just to uh, personally thank Mr. Clarion for his great work, his leadership. I know they won first place in the novice division, second place and third place in the advanced division. Um, several other awards were given. And so I just want to take a second to highlight our HP Code Wars team. So congratulations if you're listening. Um, and thank you again for your great leadership, Mr. Clarion. Uh, I also wanted to just highlight some of the great work uh, that has come out uh, this last month from our administration in the area of parent support. Um, I know that's been a topic a lot of us board members have shared over the years, um, and I was very happy as a parent to receive some uh, resources, and I'm looking at taking advantage of them myself and participating right along. Um, but I just thought I'd highlight um, for parents like me that get tons of emails and sometimes um, takes a little while to go back and see them, um, there some great things in your inbox recently, parents. Um, one, our LCAP, if you're wanting uh, to get involved, uh, that is a phenomenal way to get involved and have your voice be heard, uh, essentially as to where we direct our dollars here and what our priorities are. Um, additionally, there is a list of um, some parenting resources, such as Kids First providing a parenting strategies for teens. Um, not that that is ever needed for parenting teens, because I, I absolutely love parenting teens, um, but I'm excited to uh, learn more about that class. And then also March 22nd in that email, um, there was mention of an RUSD parent university. And so I myself am excited um, to learn more and get involved more, but I really just wanted to take a second to appreciate our administration um, for saying, you know, we hear you and we want to provide as many opportunities to not only provide um, support and encouragement and education, um, but also to have our parents be more involved in our district. So thank you. Um, I guess, so again, Code Wars, that was cool. I had that on my list, so, so thank you. That was, that was really good. Um, we have the Unified Games coming up on March 30th, so at Rockland High School, that's always a fun. If you've gone, please go again. If you haven't gone, it is an amazing opportunity to watch kids out there shooting hoops, and as a parent, as, as people, it's just good to see all those kids yelling, screaming, cheering. It's it's really heartwarming to, to see all that. So please, if you, if you have that on your calendar, if you don't, add it. If you do, love to see you there. Um, and I see him in the audience. Congratulations to all our winter sports athletes, especially our Whitney High School wrestling team. We've got a handful of section champions and state play, uh, contenders. So that was really good for that. We, we had a, from an RUSD standpoint, and I will give my thanks to, to Whitney because they did really well. We had a good winter sports showing in all those sports. So... Good job, go go cats! I'll uh, I'll give you the claw for uh, <laughs> for Collins, <laughs> and then um, and then uh, is it Roger. Just a curious update. I know I think you're in conversation. Maybe it's a two by two conversation at some point. I know we've seen uh, the Midas signs that say late April. So if there's any update, if we have a legit date of when we can see the buses going back in and through a normal process, I we'd super appreciate it. I know. It's not that far away, but I hope that late April doesn't become August and we're talking about this next year. So. <laughs> Absolutely, and I know that's one of the more anticipated questions in town that um, you know, we, we all want to know, and, and I'll uh, reach out back out to the city, but my latest conversations with the city, um, that, that late September uh, date, it was uh, 
or April date, sorry, not September. That would have been like a bad rumor in town. Uh, that, late, that late April date was uh, on them. You know, they've ordered all the materials and have the you know, contractors ready to go. So it, it, they're reporting if they have all those materials, then they, that's the target they plan to hit. And, but I'll reach back out for more specificity because I know we all want to know. And because and, and Highway 65 is even more crowded than ever uh, with all of us mm -hmm. on it now. But I will reach out for more updated information, but I know that date was established on materials received and crews installing. I will just uh, wanted to share publicly that uh, I attended the Placer County Administrator of the Year where um, both Davis Stewart and Matt Murphy had won and um, was excited to hear that in addition they both won at the regional level as well. Um, Davis Stewart for Regional Secondary Principal of the Year and Matt Murphy for Regional HR Administrator of the Year. So congratulations to both of them. We wish them luck. Their names are also going to be forwarded on to um, the state for uh, state consideration and we're just really grateful to have them both in our district and, and proud of them for being recognized. I just had a couple things. Uh, one, I was happy to be able to make the Springview Showcase Night a little while back with two of my kids. And um, I didn't know, because I didn't have my oldest, I had my third grader and my TKer, but um, it was so engaging. Everything that the teachers put out, it felt very thoughtfully done. Activities that were really hands-on and kind of got kids thinking and having fun with math and science. and. So we were happy to be out there, and it was kind of exciting. My, my third grader was like, oh, I didn't know that I'd be able to do all of these things. And so it's fun to get them excited about school. <laughs> um, and then this last Friday, I was happy to chair our Parker Whitney dinner auction event that we do every year. And it was, you know, a little bit, a small but mighty group, I guess, coming out after two years of not having it with COVID. And it just feels really good in our school communities to be kind of building things back up, getting parents to connect, and just, you know, making sure that we have this well-rounded community and experience. And so we're looking forward then at Quarry Trail next Friday to doing the first ever luau dance with the families. And so these things are just, I think, what makes school fun, it makes people feel connected, and I'm really happy that we're back to doing all of these things. Um, Travis and Chuck, thank you so much for your reports. It's so great to hear everything that's going on around the district and also to hear the concerns that are uppermost on people's minds. Super appreciate that. Uh, got our notes and we're, we're on it. Um, I want to, we, we often acknowledge how um, overworked and underpaid teachers are. I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, but I would love to acknowledge the CSEA staff. There's, uh, they're everywhere on every campus, and um, they're working so hard everywhere uh, you go, in the cafeterias, on the grounds, the maintenance, um, in the classrooms, in the office. They're everywhere. And we don't often acknowledge that, that they work just as hard, and they do everything they can to support the kids and what's going on. Um, super shout out to the custodians that work so hard to keep our campuses looking good and all the relationships that they have with the kids. It's wonderful to see how much the kids love the custodians that are on site. My um, son, when he graduated eighth grade, I, we bought gifts for his teachers and the only one he really cared about giving was the one to the custodian. He really wanted to bring her arose um, because she had been such an important person throughout his schooling years. And I just, I think we should acknowledge how important they are in the kids' lives because they're, they're all through their education. Um, teachers have that ability to have that close bond in the classroom for a year, but the CSEA staff often have, especially the ones that are on site, they often have all the years with the kids and they get to build those long-term relationships. So big shout out to CSEA and all that they're doing on our campuses. Um, and also just a shout out to Hannah. Um, everything I talked to Roger about this month, I would say, man, that's amazing. Who, who did this? And he would say, Hannah and her staff, Hannah and her people, everything I asked about. So thank you for all the great things that you're doing. Superintendent Stock. 
So I, I just wanted to kind of, you, you all I like, like read my notes. So the parent university that Trustee Setoff mentioned, if you uh, have an opportunity to pre-sign up, that way we make sure we have all the big spaces there, free parking. Um, also, and we have a several hundred folks already signed up within a couple days of having sent this out. So we really are, are excited about that. Um, and, and we also wanted to just, as we talked about some of the, our amazing staff and some of their awards and accolades, also wanted to uh, share that um, the California School of Public Relations Association also honored Sandeep Dosanjh, our Chief of Communications, uh, with some peer-reviewed awards. And these are a little bit uh, unique in that uh, the people are, they can submit works programs and it's peer-reviewed and recognized. And one of the pieces that he was recognized for that I think really speaks to the leadership of the board in our community is the work around combating the issue of fentanyl poisoning. And, and so on one of the pieces, he was recognized for his work there and had an opportunity to have the Didiers come down with him to their, uh, their conference uh, and, and was able to introduce them to all the different school district public relations people and connect them to further help them spread their, their just powerful and message around, around fentanyl. So, and we know that's been a priority of the board uh, as well. And, and so again, our, our, we are just wonderful and rock and fine from every angle to have just phenomenal people working here and, and appreciate the board's recognition of them. Um, also, I, I would just add that um, in, in regards to the late start issue, which has been something our community vetted widely years ago before the legislature decided in their wisdom to impose it, um, is that we, you know, we, we do all have a role from um, our, all of our settings, whether it's um, from our, 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 our CTA and labor partners and CSBA and others to continue to advocate the legislature to um, return um, those decisions back to local school districts because um, you know we, we are really it, it's a I'm glad we're continuing to collaborate look for solutions work together dialogue look what other maybe other districts have other ideas because we're all in this boat together of these impacts you hear we talk about them in superintendent groups on in as well around the frustration of um, that we, we have these and we don't have, for example, we aren't getting money to put in lights of every field to allow us to move back start times and allow students to stay in class. So there is a frustration that, that was sent to us but with no funding around implementation or even implementation around busing and other things. So um, we, we, we need to continue to work at it because it impacts our kids, but, but there is, I think we can still continue to try to advocate for changes um, now that we're seeing the impacts as well. We'll now move to uh, item 8.1, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? Okay, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Okay, first Second. by Trustee Price. Second. Second by Trustee Counter. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Okay, motion passes. On to item 9.1, action on the transportation plan. Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent, Business and Operations. President Hub, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. Um, unfortunately, uh, Matt Sanchez, our Director of Transportation, is out ill today, so I will be presenting our transportation plan. Um, I want to thank Matt, even though he's not here, for all of his hard work in preparing this transportation plan. So we'll review the... Uh, the apportionment, 
the requirements for um, this home school transportation reimbursement and then our actual plan. So this year is the first year of ongoing funding that we've been waiting a long time for, for an adjustment to home to school transportation. Um, the um, new costs are based on the prior year's actual costs. So 22-23's um, reimbursement will be based on 21-22's actual home school transportation costs with some adjustments. And you'll see later in the um, presentation the actual calculation. And basically, the only requirements are that the board approve a trans for us to develop a transportation plan and the board to approve it uh, before April 1st annually. Um, so the requirements of the plan are um, the plan must describe transportation services for the following groups of students, PK through sixth grade, homeless students, students with disabilities, and unduplicated students, which means English language learners, foster youth, and those that meet income or categorical eligibility requirements for free or reduced price meals under the National School Lunch Program. Consultation with stakeholders is required, and then it must be presented in an open meeting um, with the opportunity for in-person and remote public comments, and as I stated, approved before April 1st. This is our current transportation services uh, program that you'll see tonight. The district provides transportation to all students who are eligible and apply for services. Therefore, all students that are eligible are receiving priority. The walking distances are established by the board in Administrative Regulation 3541 and are listed here in the PowerPoint. Transportation is not provided to students living in uh, six of our elementary school uh, boundaries because they are um, within the established walking distances. And um, this next slide says free transportation, but I'm going to edit it a little bit. Uh, transportation is provided to students in all grades who reside outside of the walking distances at our other six elementary schools, at our secondary schools, um, if they apply for the service. Um, we'll talk about uh, free transportation in a later slide. Um, at Antelope Creek, Rock Rockland Elementary, and Springview, um, we have the most general education bus stops to support students' access to school. Sierra Elementary and Whitney High School also have a high number of bus stops um, as a result of the, the, their boundaries and the distances um, students have to walk. Um, and in 22-23, um, our ridership is about almost 1,000 students. Um, 120 of those are um, students with special needs. So addressing uh, free services, free transportation services are provided to students who have an individual education plan that includes transportation as a listed service. Um, it's also provided to homeless and foster youth students and qualified low-income students that apply and are within the approved service areas. Uh, Rockland Unified continues to meet and collaborate with multiple parties and receive input on its transportation plan. Uh, the director um, consulted with the Sacramento Air Pollution Control District, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, and the Department of Public Works Transit Division. Um, and I also want to thank Hannah Anderson, our Director of Innovation, School Programs, and Accountability for her help in reviewing the online surveys, meetings, emails, and public comments as part of our consultation process. Uh, this is the uh, reimbursement calculation. They do take our prior year um, costs, and then they back out the, uh, the add-on in the local control funding formula that has been frozen since 2013 of $223,000 to come up with our annual reimbursement. Um, and so this is um, 
presented to you as a two-year plan for 22-23 and 23-24. So with the board approval of this transportation plan, the district meets requirements for this reimbursement apportionment, and um, we, as calculated, the district will receive $688,000 um, in this fiscal year after the plan is submitted and uh, are approved, and it's projected to receive a million twenty-three thousand in twenty-three twenty-four. That concludes my presentation. Sorry, just just a couple questions. The why behind this is it more anticipated fuel costs and increase, or is it the need for new buses, new transportation, like old equipment type thing? Or is this just they they finally figured it out and we've been asking for so long and? Yes, the um, <laughs> they been asking for years to change the actual for funding formula. They didn't touch that, although they, for the first time um, starting next year, are going to apply the COLA. But instead of doing that work of addressing the funding formula, this is how they addressed it, by just saying, okay, we're going to start with 60% uh, reimbursement of your expenditures. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or comments? I would just, trustees, note on, 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 on slide uh, 10, Barbara, if you can pull that up, that while we appreciate the state making efforts to uh, provide additional funding, in that small box on the left-hand corner, you can still see that the state is still failing to cover the actual cost to the district. So out of the general fund, this is what we use to pay all of the you know, great employees we have, provide services, we still have to contribute. Um, you can see nine hundred and three thousand hundred thousand dollars in twenty two twenty three, and we're anticipating six hundred and ten thousand dollars in twenty three twenty four just to cover the cost of transportation. So, um, I mean, you can imagine if we didn't have these additional revenues, how that was well over a million dollars. And so, while this is a significant step in the right direction, we we continue to urge the state to do better. Um, as these costs increase. Anything else? Is there a motion to approve the transportation plan? So moved. First by Trustee Counter. Second. Second by Trustee Sutherland. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Stadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Um, now we'll move on to item 9.2, Action on Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Contract and Program Update. Hannah Anderson, Director, Innovation School Programs and Accountability, and Ashley Lopez, Coordinator, Expanded Learning, will be presenting. Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock. Before I start, I just want to say thank you, President Hupp. I work on an amazing team and I work um, with and for um, our students, and uh, I love what I do. So it's all to serve our kids. Thank you, I appreciate it. And again, I work on an amazing team, so Roger might have said it was me, superintendent might have said it was me. But takes, takes all of us. All right, we are here tonight um, with our new coordinator of expanded learning to share with you an update on our uh, expanded learning opportunities program and um, ask for action on a draft contact, contract. This evening, we will review with you program information, share updates since the original plan was approved in spring of 2022, and um, provide next steps. As a reminder, California Education Code 46120 identified the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program um, and provides funding for after school and summer enrichment programs for transitional kindergarten students all the way through sixth grade. Expanded learning means that there are programs that could take place before school, after school, and in the summertime, during intercessions when we have professional development days or during uh, breaks. And these programs um, are designed to uh, help support academic, social, emotional, and physical needs of uh, and interests of pupils through hands-on learning opportunities. Uh, during Ashley's portion this evening, she'll be sharing with you about how Rockland um, interprets this and all of the great plans we have for students. The program must uh, extend the school day for nine hours, and it must um, span 175 school days. 
It also um, needs to extend to 30 additional nine-hour intercession days. And again, we'll share more details on that in a bit. Funding is based on prior year uh, average daily attendance rates, uh, specifically for our unduplicated students. So as was shared, um, that is our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, including our students living in homelessness, our foster youth, and our English learner students. So it's specifically based on that um, percentage of our students. This school year, we received just over $2 million uh, to fund this program. Next year, we are anticipating a similar funding level to this year. Uh, however, that will be finalized um, more as we see that may revise and adopt a budget um, and revised for this year. And with that, I'm going to welcome up Ashley uh, to share with you about our enrollment and our program. Good evening, trustees. Our ELO program must be offered to all TK through 6th grade unduplicated elementary school students. As stated previously, this encompasses our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, our English learners, foster youth, and students living in homelessness. In our district, in our elementary schools, this encompasses about 1,400 students. Our USD must provide access to any TK through 6th grade unduplicated pupil upon parent or guardian request, and our USD anticipates about 50% enrollment in this program. We will begin this program in summer 2023 with the following offerings. Our summer school program will be held at Sunset Ranch. This program will encompass our traditional summer school program, which will operate for four weeks during the time of June 12th through July 7th. New this year, we will be offering an English learner newcomer camp, which will be geared towards our third through sixth grade students who are new to the country within the last year. These programs will take place from 8 a.m. to noon. Following those programs, though, our ELO program with Catalyst Kids will provide an extended day to meet the nine-hour requirement that the state has in place. In addition to these offerings, we will also be operating at a new site for a second summer program. This will be held at Rock Creek Elementary this year, and this ELO program will be a partnership with Catalyst Kids in which it will offer child care to our unduplicated students in our district. This will run for a duration of six weeks this summer. Lastly, we will be offering camp and other enrichment opportunities. Our camp will first be our dual language camp, and this will be targeted towards our kindergarten through second grade students. And then following that camp in July, we will also have a second camp, which is operating as a STEAM week, We'll partner with Catalyst Kids to do that as our primary source, and then we'll also be contracting with other vendors such as Mad Science to bring in some enrichment opportunities. Students will also have limited summer library access with our RUSD library aids and summer learning challenges in both reading and math that they can complete at home. Our partnership with Catalyst Kids will exist in two ways as we go forward. Number one illustrates the existing program and partnership that we have with Catalyst currently. This is a Catalyst Kids license program that is operated currently out of our REEF facilities. This provides both before and after school care to our USD families that's available for pay. Our second and new partnership will be our Catalyst Kids license exempt ELO program. This program will operate out of district facilities and will provide both after school care as well as intercession care to available RUSD unduplicated pupils as part of our ELO program. As we look ahead and plan for our 2023-24 school year, we are beginning to send out interest surveys to families to let them know about our program and to then work on enrolling those families directly through Catalyst Kids. Participation is entirely voluntary and up to each family to partake in. As a result of our need for a nine-hour day, a sample schedule has been provided. If a school were to start at 7.50 and end at 2.20, that would be a six and a half hour day. But in order to meet our nine-hour requirement of our ELO program, 
we would contract with Catalyst Kids during the hours of 2.20 to 4.50 to extend the day. Now we recognize that this time frame ending at 4.50 would be a little bit awkward, so we work with Catalyst for our early start sites to <coughs> round off to releasing students at 5 and at our later start schools, 5.30. RUSD um, would then receive a bill from Catalyst directly for any unduplicated student enrollment costs. Some important elements of our Catalyst program are as follows. Catalyst kids will start off with a meeting time each day that the students come in. And this time, they will welcome students. They will provide information about the activities for the school day. And then they will encompass a social-emotional component. Following this time will be homework time. We have asked um, Catalyst kids to prioritize homework for our students, especially in the area of mathematics, as we recognize that this is a district need and feel strongly that having an additional adult be there to answer questions for a student that needs help is essential. We will also have the opportunity for the students to play games, do arts and craft projects, and engage in STEM challenges. We will also work to ensure that a Chromebook cart is available for our students in our after-school programs so that they can work on ST Math online. And at some sites, we will offer after-school tutoring. In addition to this, we have indoor and outdoor recreational opportunities for students, including dramatic play, art, STEM, and reading. And Catalyst will incorporate 21st century learning skills of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. Catalyst does an excellent job serving students' interests and incorporating those in, into building thematic units that match the needs of each school site. There will be some additional program components that are the result of our ELO program. RUSD will need to establish one designated classroom at each of our 12 elementary school sites as a hub for our ELO program. This hub will serve as a location for our Catalyst staff to be able to house their curriculum, as well as for us to provide a refrigerator for after-school snack services. And I just want to give a shout out to our site principals who have been very accommodating in making sure that there is space for this program at each of their school sites. Additionally, transportation will also be impacted next year, though to be really clear about that, it will only take place um, with an impact during our summer school timeframe. ELO requires that we uh, bus our students to and from our ELO program if it is not offered at their <coughs> resident school site. So because we're only holding our ELO program this summer at Sunset Ranch and Rock Creek, we will be required to bus our students to that program. But because during next school year, we are operating at all 12 school sites, it will not require additional transportation services for our, our students. It will also have an impact on nutrition services as our lunch um, will be provided on intercession days through RUSD for a period of time during the summer months um, and through Catalyst Kids during intercession days that fall in the school calendar, such as the November break and February break. Snack will be provided on all after school days through Catalyst Kids as well. So as we continue to move forward with this program, um, we initially sent out a survey last week to all of our families of unduplicated students to let them know um, about the program and the offerings and for the purpose of both planning and pre-enrollment. From there, we will follow up with our families to send out registration um, and really to target, even though all of our unduplicated students are eligible for this, we really would like to spend additional time targeting our students who need tier three supports, including students experiencing homelessness and our foster youth. So we will follow up directly with phone calls to those individuals to further support them. Thank you. Okay, so on to next steps. Uh, tonight, uh, we are requesting the board take action to authorize a superintendent or designee to execute an ELOP contract with Catalyst Kids. This uh, will allow for us, uh, well, it actually allows Catalyst Kids to move forward with their hiring. We know that in a staffing shortage, it is very challenging to um, get enough staff to run this program by June. So this would authorize us. It would also allow RUSD to move forward with 
marketing and enrollment and reaching out to individuals um, who we would like to make sure are enrolled, right? That priority access piece that we've talked about previously in the LCAP. Um, and then this uh, uh, draft action in substantially the same form, including material terms as the draft ELOP contract presented, including a fee amount not to exceed 1.7 million based on a projected 50% enrollment. Additional next steps uh, will include continuing with our summer program enrollment. We have already sent that interest survey to start moving forward with that. Um, and we have started identifying students that will be eligible for our summer school programs. And then next steps would also include an interest survey followed by um, the enrollment process for the 23-24 school year. Uh, at this time, um, staff recommends the board make a motion after obviously any questions you may have uh, to approve next steps as presented and authorize the superintendent or designee to execute a contract with Catalyst Kids in substantially the same form as the draft presented to provide the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah and Ashley. Are there any questions? Yeah, just I got one, um, and I think we're square, but we talked about one to two classrooms at each elementary. We have the capacity, right? Like that's, we're not having to shift people around or. At the majority of our schools, um, Ashley uh, has been working very closely with Craig and his Good. team to identify and make sure. Um, we're also, um, we, can give a, we can give an early thank you to his team and our custodial staff and maintenance crew who will be helping to relocate some things and some of the rooms that we're using are used for storage currently and so it will um, it'll require a little shifting but yes um, some of our some of our schools will require more than others and we also can use um, flexible spaces so for example they're going to have the one hub classroom at every single school where things can be located but we might overflow into another classroom that's vacant or a third we may also overflow into a library media center space that's not used after school or a multi-purpose room space that's not used after school. So there's a lot of flexibility in the types of spaces we can use. We just know it'll be best for the program to have one hub space. Thank you. I love the flexibility. So just want to make sure we're square there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say I really appreciated the uh, outreach slide. Um, you know, I know we were looking at, I think we said about 1,400 students would qualify for this. Uh, we're hoping about 50% will take advantage and enroll. Um, I really appreciated that it, it's listed out. Hey, we want to have targeted outreach because we know a lot of these families that may really need this service for one reason or another, they may not take advantage of it. And so I'd love to see us put high priority on that of reaching out to the families that, you know, we're with them every day. We know that they could really benefit from this service and maybe, maybe parents are working and, um, you know, might miss an email or two. And so I appreciate some of the steps on here of not just an email, but the, the school messenger emails, phone calls. Um, the outreach from the teacher, from the school staff, uh, phone calls to the family specifically if they receive tier three supports. So I really, really appreciate that. I mean, um, barring from driving to their house, which I don't know, that still might not be a bad idea, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and I know it's a silly, but the flyer in the backpack, like I was the mom that read the flyers. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but I just wanted to say thank you because I would love to see uh, this be an opportunity um, if we're going to offer this service, right, that we make sure the kids that really need it get access to it. So thank you. I have a couple questions. Thank you. That was really informative. It covered a lot of things that were kind of coming to my mind as we went through it step by step. Um, so kind of going along with Trustee Sadhoff, with the 50% projection, um, how confident kind of in that number are you guys? And with the hiring that Catalyst plans, is there room for if the number exceeds that? So we are making our best estimate with our 50%. This is a brand new program in the state. We, that's a bit higher than we anticipate um, we'll start with okay. to end with 50%, um, just based on some preliminary interest that we're receiving and some outreach we've done previously. We think that's, um, that's high. Mm -hmm. However, we also know that word will travel. And so we are anticipating that over the year, the program will grow. Uh, to be able, um, and we, we also know that um, families might have interest in the program and may have missed uh, this first enrollment window. 
So we're still working out all of the details of the enrollment pieces. However, we do know that we'll have windows throughout the year where students can enroll if they missed that first opportunity. And we'll likely need to have some type of um, lead time with those windows where you may tell us by one date and then we give Catalyst firm numbers again. They get an opportunity to hire staff or move staff that they, you know, because maybe one site is shifting um, their enrollment or decreasing. So we do want to give them time. We won't be able to say necessarily um, we have 20 students and they want to start tomorrow because for every TKer that's in the program, we need two staff members. Okay, that's what is the ratio in the classroom? 20 um, to 1 uh, in grades first through sixth, and 10 to 1 in TK and K. And that is actually more restrictive class size numbers than are required during the school day. Right. Um, and one of the reasons why this is a, you know, we, we agree that, I'm going to add this in here, that there should be a lot of outreach. We also know that if we were to have 100% participation in this program, we would far exceed uh, the amount of money that is allocated to Rockland Unified to run this program. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure our students who are in the most need are prioritized. They get those phone calls first. We get them registered. We get them going. And then um, we do outreach and are able to meet a target enrollment that'll benefit our students and families, but it'll still keep us fiscally within the parameters of the program. Remind me, is the ELOP money just a one year or is it continuing? It is continuing. Okay. Yes. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no. So go um, ahead and then I'll finish. Well, so kind of on that note then as well, if, if we were, because I know we have this amount not to exceed, if enrollment were to be higher than anticipated, is there a legal obligation to not turn those students away if they qualify? That is a great question. We need to meet the, the law that says all students need to be able to, any of those unduplicated students need to have access to the program. So if we were to need to exceed the 1.7 amount, we would need to renegotiate our contract and have the opportunity to look again at, at how do we best serve those students and we would be prepared to do that. We have some draft language already in the contract that um, would um, have Ashley meeting with our her Catalyst counterpart. There will be a director that is just overseen on the Catalyst side that supports the um, Expanded Learning Opportunity Program. They will be meeting uh, each month to review enrollment numbers and to see if we're forecasting an increase. And so we would be able to see that that was coming well in advance of that 1.7 million, in okay. my opinion, and uh, would be able to renegotiate to meet those needs. And then with them, um, the transportation, because they can have transportation home after the 450 end, did that require additional um, hours for those transportation employees? Yes, yeah, so I've been in meetings currently with transportation services. They um, are able to meet the needs of those students to bus them back. And we have a pretty good plan in place. He says he has drivers who are willing to operate at that time. So that's been a great collaboration. That's great. And we'll clarify that that is only during the summer months. OK. So during the school year, we, are, we, are not, we would not be able uh, to meet that obligation. Uh, because that would require us to have drivers that would work very early in the morning mm -hmm. and then drivers that would work very um, late into the evening, and that would be too burdensome. So we can get around the transportation requirement by having uh, the, the program run out of each, 12, each of our 12 elementary sites, and then we do not have a transportation obligation. I see, because they're going within the boundaries of their school. Yes. Okay, that's what I was wondering, because I knew that would maybe require negotiations mm -hmm. at that um, union level. Everyone can take a sigh every week. <laughs> no busing home at 5 o'clock. Um, I just have one last thing that is maybe related, but maybe not totally um, contract type. Um, so I saw the slide that shows that there's the Catalyst license program in the REEF facility, and then there's this license exempt ELOP program, district facilities. So these students then will be attending after school these that are enrolled in Catalyst and these that are part of ELOP, 
are they together? Are they like siloed off separately? And do we anticipate any, um, if they are separate, any kind of social, socio-emotional concerns with, oh, you're going to that program and I'm going to this program? They are two different programs. Mm -hmm. One, um, one program, um, they, they are two different programs running simultaneously on the same campus in much the same way that we have current after school programs running out of our, all of our elementary schools currently, right? And some of them are fee-based and some of them are not fee-based. So we are also though being very thoughtful about how do we um, make sure that it doesn't look like one program is one way and one program is another way. Um, in that even thinking about designated spaces and what kinds of furniture needs to be in those spaces and how does it look substantially similar so that um, all of our students are having a similar experience. I do anticipate that there could be times where they are mixing. Maybe there's outdoor play and both um, sites, uh, uh, both sets of students are out there. I think those are details that we're still to work out with, uh, with Catalyst. I don't anticipate inside of facilities that there would be commingling because they are two different programs with two different facility uh, use agreements um, for the students that would be um, there. Um, however, we also don't anticipate, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we anticipate this being as big of a challenge as we originally thought it could be. So I think that we have been able to um, work with Catalyst, uh, and, and Catalyst has been really working on how do we create a very strong expanded learning program that is a desirable place for students to go, and no one, um, we don't anticipate you'll be able to see much of a difference. Thank you. What are the staffing requirements for this, um, like qualifications? So our Catalyst staff that is hired has to um, have either two years of college, essentially, an AA degree, or um, be passing, able to pass an instructional aid exam. OK. My, my reason for asking my thought behind that was, in addition to the importance of us marketing to families, we have Sierra College and Sac State and William Jessup, and that is another opportunity for, you know, even if it's not us, but to suggest to Catalyst Kids that they're marketing to some of our graduates and at least our local students that are studying elementary education or child development. Um, these are great opportunities for experience for them. And trustees, this is why we wanted to bring this as soon as we could, because every school district in the state has this legal requirement. So we're all trying to get the same kids. And as you, we still know businesses are experiencing staffing shortages. And, and so we wanted to get out as quick as we could to um, make sure that we can staff the program, because the requirement doesn't say, well, if you couldn't quite find people, it's OK. And so that is, uh, there are a lot of huge challenges. And the other piece is that you can see the significance of this program. And we are going to learn a lot this year. This is uh, going to be a lot of continuous improvement uh, in process um, because we, we are looking forward to really learning and seeing how we can also reinforce district initiatives. Like you heard the math component we've done. We're excited as the work related to Prop 28 expanding arts and music it gets going if we can add some of those elements in as we start to build capacity. So we think there's a lot of exciting learning to do, um, but we will be closely monitoring and really on the sites to. Uh, take a look and invite you to come out and see, you know, are there differences, are there not, and, and just what that feels like. Yeah, I also am thinking in relation to the LCAP and those meetings that are coming up, because I recall that there were discussions about extended school day for some, you know, our unduplicated population. So I'll be interested to see how that kind of works into it and maybe provides more flexibility to use some of these resources in another way. Just want to say welcome, Ashley, and thank you both for your work. Thank you both very much. This was a ton of work and awesome job. Thank you. Oh, we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> so is there a motion to approve the Extended Learning Opportunities Program and authorize the superintendent or designee to execute on ELOP contract with Catalyst Kids not to exceed $1.7 million? So moved. First by... Trustee Price? Second. <laughs> Second by Trustee Sadoff. Um, so this is a motion 
to approve the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program and authorize the superintendent or designee to execute the ELOP contract with Catalyst Kids not to exceed 1.7 million. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. They said they would do it. Yeah, yeah, so if there's an adjustment to the contract, we will come back to the board um, uh, if, if, uh, for that adjustment. I just would hate to see that limit our services. So that's why I just wanted to check. Is that, would that, would that delay students' needs being met, or do you feel like that's a fast turnaround if you needed to go over the 1.7 million? Uh, when, uh, as uh, Hannah uh, mentioned, that when, as they meet monthly to review anticipated enrollment staffing needs, we anticipate, uh, we, we expect that we'll be able to anticipate that need and then come back to the board prior to, to seek additional authority. Great, I just wanna make sure we don't hold you up. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, now on to item 9.3, action on second interim report and budget revisions. Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent, Business and Operations. Good evening again. Uh, so tonight I'll prevent, present the uh, highlights of the second interim report, which is in your board packet. Uh, first, I wanna thank all of the departments for reviewing and updating their department budget projections. And I especially wanna thank Beth Parrish, Director of Fiscal Service, here tonight. Uh, along with our business department staff for all of their hard work um, in preparing the second interim estimate actuals and multi-year projection for you. I'll be reviewing the uh, certification, budget basics and uh, reporting cycle, major changes in the general fund since the first interim, the multi-year projection, uh, potential changes, in our assumptions, uh, major changes in other funds, and then the next steps in our budget process. Uh, based on current assumptions, the district will be able to meet uh, its financial obligations for the current and two future years, and therefore with your approval, staff will file a positive certification with the Placer County Office of Education, and I will show you the multi-year uh, further on in the presentation. So um, here are some um, reminders of when we report, uh, formally report about the financial um, activity and uh, position uh, to the board. We're at second interim, and um, based on um, um, the budget are based on assumptions and actual events. Uh, changing conditions require changes in our assumptions throughout the year. And um, all budgets are based on the best projections possible, adjusting for actual revenue and expenditures throughout the year. So at second interim, um, the actuals are through July, uh, January 31st, and then our projections are for the remainder of the year. Um, so we're here in March at second interim report. Our next formal uh, report to the board will be um, estimated actuals in for 22-23 with the adopted 23-24 budget in June. And then along with the, um, the uh, local control accountability plan. Our major changes in the general fund since first interim, which um, we brought to you in December, um, is $411,000 in our state local control funding formula. Um, we got a certification from the state in, Jan um, in February um, stating that they're allowing us to receive funding for RICA ADA from 1920. So that's the uh, increase. And then there was an increase in our UPP percentage when we certified um, in um, January. Um, the eight electric buses that we thought we were going to receive in June will not be here by June 30th. And so therefore, reporting the cost of those buses and the grant revenue to pay for them is being moved into um, the next fiscal year. We are hearing possibly August. Um, but we still have the bus, we still have enough buses to provide transportation 
um, the buses that they're replacing will not be crushed, obviously, until we get the new buses. Um, interest income is finally going up. We're getting over 2% now. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well, for a long time it was, you know, a 0.2, a 0.3. And so it's even increased from um, December when we were getting almost 1%. So that's an increase. Um, you'll see that in all funds. And then as we did the analysis um, in our second interim, we go through and look at all of our uh, department and site budgets. And um, so at this point, we're looking at um, estimated savings of 563 in site budgets and 375,000 in supplemental, I think, LCAP. Um, and so those funds will be carried over when we close the books um, in um, September, we'll book those carryovers for them to use in the next fiscal year. Okay. Uh, we purchased another 250 uh, Chromebooks through the federal ECF program. Uh, so both revenues and expenditures for those purchasers um, are increased by 100,000. We received a one-time assessment from our um, excess liability carrier um, of $154,000 and um, offset by the final billing for our liability insurance. Um, you saw a presentation about the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. That was originally budgeted to start earlier this year. Um, by starting it in June, we're moving um, $1.1 million of expenditures out of this year's budget. And then each year we look at the projects that are planned for deferred maintenance and repair projects and, and try to estimate how much of that is going to be completed in June and then how much will be completed in the next fiscal year. And so we've estimated that $581,000 of those projects will not be completed by June 30th. And be reported next year's budget. This is a summary of the changes I reviewed, um, but it's in the SACS format that you'll see in the SACS report. Um, this document is for changes from first interim to second, and so um, there's a $1.2 million, um, $1.2 million of the increase in revenues over expenditures since first interim was unrestricted, and $2.2 million is in restricted resources. So the total change in fund balance is $3.4 million. Uh, this is the multi-year projection for unrestricted only. Unrestricted meaning no specific legal restrictions on the expenditures of funds, other than it has to be for an educational purpose. Based on current assumptions, there's no deficit spending projected and unrestricted, as you can see on uh, line C. It's important to know this because when we look at the combined multi-year projection um, for the general fund um, that we submit to um, in our SACS report, you can see that there is uh, projected deficit spending in 23-24 and 24-25. That's planned. Um, and it's due to grants and um, planned one-time spending. So, for example, we received the Educator Effectiveness Funds in 21-22, um, but we have a five-year plan of spending those. And uh, if you recall, you approved the, um, that three-year spending plan last fall. We're receiving those funds this year, but we have a three-year spending plan. And uh, most of those are being spent in the uh, future years. Um, you'll also see here uh, an additional year, 2526 is now um, presented for you because when we bring you back the adopted budget um, in June, that year will be coming into the three-year required uh, reporting. Um, these uh, projections only include estimated step column and increased pension costs. They don't include um, they don't include other compensation increases in the out years um, of the multi-year projection. And then um, more detailed budget assumptions by year are included in the multi-year that was attached to your SACS report in your board agenda. 
This is just another way of looking at how the district receives and spends its money. 71% uh, of the funding this year is through the state's local control funding formula, and that's based on average daily attendance. And then 82% of our expenditures are for employees and salary benefits because we are a people business. So uh, the, the, we've included um, in the LCFF funding formula for 23-24 uh, the higher COLAs. So we've got the Department of Finance's COLAs projections for all three of our, um, our proposed, our projected budget. And that's using the three prior year ADA um, um, calculation to maximize our funding. We've also assigned uh, 2.5 million in fund balance um, for the proposed, the governor's proposed cut, mid-year cut in our arts and music instructional materials discretionary block grant. Um, so that's in all three of the years in the assigned um, underlined 4A in case that becomes law in order to continue implementing the board's approved plan um, uh, that was approved back in October. Um, the district has a healthy reserve. Um, if you look at the blue highlighted line, um, unassigned reserve for economic uncertainty, we've got 9.68 percent in 22-23. Uh, the 16.7 million dollars represents about 30 days of payroll. And there are a lot of things that can change in our budget. Um, this, these are the most of the major ones. We won't know our enrollment, obviously, next year until school starts. Um, and that won't be finalized until we certify CBEDS, which is an October date. Um, ADA for funding purposes is not known until April for P2. That won't affect our funding for this year much, but it will be affecting our, our um, out years because as we're using our prior three-year ADA. Um, and then um, the, bill, the bill back for special education services, we don't receive the final billing for those services from Placer County Office of Education until next November after we've had the books closed. So that will be an estimate. And our special education expenditures um, are continuing to rise, um, just like utilities and other costs, but we won't know those final costs until we close the books in September. And then we'll be incorporating expenditures based on the um, local control accountability plan into our adopted budget, and that will be in June. The economy uh, funding projections by the Department of Finance are based on the current economic uh, forecasts of a softening economy, but no recession. Um, but we don't know what the impact of the inflation, rising interest rates, war in Ukraine, now possible banking crisis um, will have on the economy. And we won't, we also won't know the final state income tax revenues at the state level in time for their adopted budget because um, the state has extended the deadline from April to October. Um, to submit those tax returns. So that will be another item of uncertainty as we prepare our budgets for 23-24. We're not expecting any new state programs in the state adopted budget. And as I stated earlier, we don't know about if um, the legislature will go along with the mid-year cut proposed in the arts, music, instructional materials and uh, discretionary block grant. So. Um, and then federal programs, we tend to not know until between October and March of the following year, so we're just basing that on historical trends and information we get from CDE. Major changes in other funds, interest rates in all funds, um, and the Plaster County Treasury is affecting all funds, so we're looking at $404,000 increased rates in the other funds. Nutrition services, we were very conservative when we built the 23-24 budget. We didn't know how the free meals um, program was going to work. 
and we have um, significantly increased our um, meals that we're serving, which is wonderful. And so our revenues are going up, our expenditures are going up. Um, and then we're also receiving another uh, supply chain assistance grant of $353,000. And then in our capital projects, we've got another adjustment. We don't think the Quarry Trail um, new portable project will be completed by June. That's getting get extended. And we also have an adjustment down um, for developer fees as they're not coming in as it's originally budgeted. And then next steps, you know, as um, you know, we'll be, we're working on um, the local control accountability plan. We're continuing to build the budget and meet with our, um, we've already actually met with our, um, our sites on their budget plans. Um, we're waiting for the May revise. We'll be bringing the estimated actuals and final adjustments for the um, budget back to you during the public hearing in June, um, along with the LCAP. And then state adoption is expected to be on time. That concludes my presentation. Any questions? You actually answered my question, okay. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna highlight it just in case anybody out sure. there is listening, because I think you did a phenomenal job of the way you addressed it. Um, slides 9 and 10 show what could appear to some if they weren't listening as a built-in structural deficit. But I really appreciated your um, attention to highlighting and even the note on that slide um, that this is really, although it does show up in two of the years as deficit spending, it's really due to grants and one-time spending because of how it fell in the timeline. Um, but that the 2526 shows that there's not a structural deficit spending built into our model. I know that's important to many in the community and to me. I know sometimes when we receive the money from the state or a grant, we're not always able to spend it in that year. Right. Um, so I guess more of a comment because you already answered it for me, um, but I just wanted to thank you for th taking the time to explain that because sometimes that can be a little concerning. So thank you. You're welcome. I, I just, so thank you. Like th this is This is... It's an amazing amount of work and time for you and your staff putting all this stuff together and, and piling it out. And I know a lot of it is based on models and estimates, and I know when the state doesn't give you factual data, you got to make an estimate, you got to put a number out there, and you got to try to line things up. And it's never easy to make a guess and then build math off of guesses. So thank you for that. I sincerely appreciate. Um, and I think it's, it's good to show, and, and I know I've asked uh, Roger a couple times for it, so thank you that 8218 number. So again, we're a service organization. We have a lot of people that are involved in educating and taking care of the, the, you know, our kiddos during the day. So it's really good to illustrate that 82% you know, of it is people and 18% of it is facilities and programs and structural materials and equipment and all that stuff. And if I want more in one direction, it's gotta come from another. So you know, that we've only have 100% of the pie to ever chop up. So thank you for that and uh, let's hope we can continue on that trend. Is that all? Okay, excellent. So is there a motion to approve the second interim report and budget revisions? Motion. First by Trustee Sutherland. Oh, second. Sat off. <laughs> <laughs> and second by Trustee Sutherland. Mm -hmm. yes. Motion passes. We got a vote? I'm sorry, Georgia, we, we, will you please it, call it, the roll? It'd be pretty easy, I I'm think. I'm just but. throwing, I'm just going right over that. <laughs> so so good. Good. <laughs> I know, right? Derek Strong. Counter. Yes. <laughs> Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Now the motion passes. Thank you, Georgia. All right, we will now open agenda item 11.1, .1, public comment on non-agenda items. We want to remind everyone that this agenda item is to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to ask questions or discuss non-agenda items with the board. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. A complaint about a specific employee of the district shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or the principal as required by Administrative Regulation 1312.1. We have one, oh, never mind, it changed. Are they, and they're all non-agenda here. Okay. 
All right, so for verbal comments, please fill out a green public comment card, complete with all information, and turn it in prior to the agenda item. We're not doing that. I'll call your name, step up to the podium, and I'll let you know who's on deck. When you approach the podium, please restate your name, the city you live in, and the school your, chi your children attend. You'll have three minutes to address the board. All comments must be respectful, no profanity. And we now invite Eric Berg to the podium. And Laz Enriquez will be on deck. All right, hello, Superintendent um, Stock and Board. My name is Eric Berg. My son, Anth I live in Rockland. My son, Anthony Berg, is a junior at, on the wrestling team at Whitney High School. My daughter, Grace, is an incoming freshman at Whitney, and my youngest son, Luke, is part of the Cats Club there at Whitney. I am one of the wrestling coaches at Springview Middle School. I am one of four coaches there because there's a need. There is a need. Wrestling is one of the fastest growing sports, especially among the ladies. This year, we had over 60 kids at Springview and about the same number over at Granite Oaks as well. A lot of these kids will come to Whitney, and we want to be able to accommodate them. Whitney's program is also growing with over 40 kids on the team this year and 52 involved with the youth program Cats Club. Whitney has had many successes, uh, successes such as Leah Brown winning the, her first state championship for the school. Uh, this year, Alex Madej took fifth at state and Berg won a section title. We finished the year as a team as 14th best in the section. Out of the top 20 teams in our section, we are the only team that does not have a wrestling room. With talks of adding two great schools into our division, Davis and Jesuit, we want to be able to compete in the SFL. We would like to grow the sport and we would like your help in developing our kids. We would like to advocate for the construction of a wrestling facility in our school based on the Title IX standards. Title IX is a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in education programs and activities. In the context of sports, Title IX requires that schools provide equal opportunities for male and female students to participate in athletics. Currently, our school's wrestling program operates out of a, a shared space that is not specifically designed for wrestling. This situation puts our female wrestlers at a disadvantage compared to their male counterparts who have access to dedicated weight rooms and training facilities. In order to comply with Title IX, we must provide equal resources and opportunities to male and female athletes. By building a new wrestling room, we can ensure that both male and female um, oh man. <laughs> wrestlers uh, have access to the equipment and facilities. In addition to the legal requirements of Title IX, there are also uh, practical benefits to investing in a new wrestling room. Uh, a ded dedicated wrestling facility will allow us to expand our program, recruit more athletes on campus to grow our team and improve our competitive competitiveness. It will also provide a safer and more secure environment to the wrestlers with equipment and facilities that are designated specifically to their needs. Overall, um, investing in a new wrestling facility is the right thing for our school's athletes and for our commitment to gender equality under Title IX. I strongly encourage you to consider this proposal and take action to support our wrestler, wrestling program and it, its athletes. We would love to talk more about our issues and would like to, you to add us to the agenda for the next board meeting in April. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to invite Laz Enriquez to the stand and Yvette Enriquez is on deck. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Laz. I am a uh, Laz Enriquez. I am a student and uh, athlete at Whitney High School, and I would like to talk about uh, water bottle refill stations at uh, Whitney High School and other schools in the Rockland School District. Um, I would like to ask why hasn't the district made any organized efforts to work with every school to get at least one water bottle refill station? Because I know as a student and especially an athlete, it, it helps to have those. Uh, I, I carry around a half gallon of water every day to school and usually finish it by the time school ends. And uh, before practice, I got to usually fill it up with like a drinking fountain. And that, that doesn't really work very well. Uh, and so I'd like to um, ask the district to offer its resources uh, to assist schools in efforts such as to inform the schools about the cost of each unit, which would be around $5,000 each, 
uh, identified locations where it could be installed, uh, source, source the stations, uh, work with approved vendors for electrical and plumbing if needed for the install, uh, offer resources for soliciting sponsorships uh, and fundraising, such as like emails, uh, social media, and news out outlets. Uh, I would like and uh, also to use internal resources, such as uh, facility maintenance personnel and uh, Whitney High School BIDA students who are uh, uh, able and willing to help complete the install. I can say that as one of them. Uh, uh, we as the BIDA students of Whitney High School and the, also the BIDA instructor, Mr. Hunter, are uh, uh, will, uh, willing and uh, ready to help uh, get any work done on campus. Thank you. Awesome, great job, Laz. Yvette is up next, and after Yvette will be Manuel. Did I say that right? Okay. Hi, um, so I'm kind of gonna ride the coattails of Eric Berg, um, talking about needing a dedicated space for wrestling, um, not only boys and girls. Um, as you can see, I have a little one, and the hope is that when she gets to high school, there's a dedicated facility. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, they currently operate out of the cafeteria. So it's a shared space, there's food, there's food on the floor, the floors are not able to be cleaned. So the mats are rolled out onto the floor with whatever happens to be dropped onto the floor that day. Um, you know, bacteria and things spread, and not only for the wrestlers, but also the kids that are eating in the cafeteria. I mean, those mats don't smell that great, you're sitting there next to it. Um, I know the stunt team also works out of the cafeteria. And you know it's hard enough to get people to participate, but if that's the room that you're walking into to do it, it doesn't really appeal to them. Um, it wouldn't appeal to me. And um, so realistically, there's a lot of scheduling conflicts. There's not a space for them. And they deserve it. They work hard. They, it shows with all of the different championships and titles and things and all the successes. And just imagine what they could accomplish if they had the proper resources and support of the team, of the school, of the community. Um, there's a lot of people within the community that are committed to try to help and offer volunteering, materials, construction, um, and any kind of form or fashion that they can contribute, they will, not only financially. And so a big part of what we're asking for is for the school district to commit to assisting in trying to make it a reality with you guys have a far reach, you have resources, you know what questions to ask, you know what's required with regards to construction, permitting, planning, consulting, inspections, different things like that. So getting you guys on board and helping guide us and help us be successful at building something that will not just be an immediate you know, in the next year or two kind of success, but it'll contribute to the community and to these student athletes for generations to come. My hope is that my grandkids have a wrestling room at Whitney High School to go and participate in. So what we're asking for is, I think what the kids deserve, because if you look at most of the teams, they have a soccer team has a practice field, the baseball teams, the football teams. Um, we don't need a new scoreboard for the t football team. We need a facility for these girls and boys to go and participate in the sport of their choice. And I think they're entitled to it because we offer it. And I think Rockland can come together. Thank you so much. And Manuel, you're up next. Everyone, uh, Manuel Enriquez, husband, father of these two, um, live in Rockland. She goes to Rock Creek, and uh, my son goes to Whitney. Um, my topic is uh, girls sports, um, and what the district is uh, gonna do to increase participation. Um, by the age of 14, girls quit sports twice the rate of boys. And by the age of 17, 51% of girls completely stop sports. Um, they need dedicated space and their own practice um, facilities for events should not be treated as second class to the boys teams. Their facilities should be equal to the boys, including uniforms, equipment, field, room, transportation to and from 
off-campus events, uh, coaching, promotions, and celebrations. Uh, they are not less important or, or valuable to the school and the community. Um, a couple of target sports that um, are lacking in some of that would be our new um, women's football, flag football. Um, what, the, what is the district going to do to support those, those girls? Um, you just heard some of the statistics I just said. It, it would be horrible to see Whitney not have a girls flag football team. Um, they should be equivalent to the boys. Same, same uh, distribution of uniforms. The boys got like three different uniforms. They get all this. Wild. It should be the same, um, along with wrestling. Uh, we've only had uh, four women uh, female wrestlers this year, um, and they've actually accomplished the most. Um, Alex Madej finished fifth in the state. She's only a sophomore. She's going to win state eventually. And then, of course, Leah Brown was the first state champion at, at Whitney. Um, so uh, if you look at the Oro, their women's team's like 45 girls because they have the facilities, they promote it. Um, it's a grungy sport, but... I mean, same with flag football. And also stunt. The stunt team is a tough sport. Um, look at their facility, again, in the cafeteria. You know, if they can split, split the wrestling room, stunt and wrestling, you know, two birds, one stone. So that's all I got to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming out as a family. Thank you for what you're teaching your children about getting involved in the community. It was wonderful to have you here tonight. Okay, so we'll now move on to pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? So I have a couple things I'm thinking out loud. Um, I know why we have the role we have that we can engage back and forth with comments. Um, I don't know that I necessarily need a formal agenda item, but I would love more information on our, our facilities that we have for wrestling and our water bottle refill stations. So if there's a way as a trustee I could get more information on both of those, um, I could even, I mean, we could set up a tour, um, but I would love to hear from district administration what we have in place for both of those areas. That would be great. Um, and trustee said often, and, and trustees, we, we will uh, follow up. One of the pieces that is a, is a future uh, work of the board is we're updating our facilities master plan. We do that every three to five years. Where the, we take a look at all of our district facilities, look at what the needs are, look at the planning piece, and um, that is uh, being in the process of development, and that is scheduled to come back to the board for uh, discussion and, and eventual approval uh, later this spring. So, so that, and Whitney High School is included in, in that facilities master plan, of course, it's one of our schools, so there will be additional information, and we can also look to uh, uh, provide some additional information uh, as you requested and on the water refill stations we'll all work with staff to provide uh, information related to what that is and then also um, I'll, we'll also work to do some follow-up to our, our student who presented this evening as well regarding some of his ideas so that we can dive deeper with him into that thank you superintendent stock nothing else okay and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>